Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. My name is Tony Shields, this is episode 32, and in this episode, we're going to be digging into an absolutely crazy story of a mushroom that was recently discovered to be growing on a living creature, and some other weird places that mushrooms have grown. We're also talking about a cross-country retail partnership with a leading functional mushroom brand and a leading nutrition retailer. Very exciting news on that front. And finally, we'll be detailing and dissecting the differences between mushrooms and fungi so you can better understand the complexities of the fifth kingdom. So if you like mushrooms, if you like the mushroom show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the channel grow. And if you want to see future episodes of the mushroom show, make sure you hit that subscribe button as well. Let's jump into the show. On to our first story. Now, we all know that mushrooms are insanely tenacious. They just want to grow. This isn't always obvious when trying to cultivate mushrooms because forcing a certain species to grow at a certain time and in a certain place can be quite difficult to master. Many people starting down this road will inevitably have a few failures along the way, growing mold or some other fungus or bacteria instead of the intended mushroom. I have definitely done this countless times myself. And one of the questions that new mushroom growers ask is, how is it possible that mushrooms can just grow out in the wild by just blasting spores out everywhere and hoping for the best? Well, here I am with a pressure sterilizer and alcohol spray and still I get nothing but trichoderma mold? Well, one simple answer is that mushrooms are mysterious and they don't always do what we expect them to do. A perfect example of this is the recent story of a mushroom found growing on a frog in India. I saw this picture recently come across my feed and I honestly couldn't believe it. It just seems so crazy to me, just way too unusual. But after all these years, I guess mushrooms are still able to offer surprises. So here's the story. Lohit YT, who is a river and wetland specialist at the World Wildlife Fund, was on an expedition in the mountains of India with some friends specifically looking for different species of reptiles and frogs. During the trip, they found a number of frogs of the species Hylorana intermedia, better known as Rouse intermediate golden-backed frog. Not the most elegant common name, but nonetheless, while looking at the frogs, they were astonished to find that one of the frogs had a perfectly shaped mushroom fruiting body protruding from its left side. The frog was alive, which is important, because this is thought to be the first and only observation of a real mushroom fruiting body protruding from a living creature in this manner. It really is remarkable. Here is the short paper that was published in Reptiles and Amphibians documenting this discovery, and it shows a bunch of other pictures you can clearly see here that the mushroom, it's not a big one, not like the frog had a toadstool growing out of them, but it is clearly a full-on little mushroom fruiting body directly growing out of the skin of the frog. The paper goes on to identify the mushroom as a bonnet mushroom, which is a Mycena species. They didn't identify the mushroom down to the species, which is too bad, because Mycena is a relatively large genus and could be one of over a thousand different species. Some grow on leaf litter, some grow on dung, but generally they grow on dead or decaying matter, and they're not supposed to be growing on frogs. There are some other species of mushrooms that grow on bugs or insects, specifically cordyceps, which we talk about quite a bit. There are over 600 different species of cordyceps, which are considered to be entomopathogenic, meaning they infect insects and fruit from their dead bodies. But this is something entirely different. The paper also talks about a common fungal infection in amphibians, due to a fungus, and I'm probably going to butcher this name, but it's called Batrachochytrium dendrobatidis, which causes a disease, which is also hard to say, called Chytrodeomycosis, and it is deadly to frogs. But that kind of fungal infection is not that unusual, and again, completely different from a fruiting mushroom on a living creature. Now, as I was looking at different articles about this story, one thing I found that a lot of people are wondering was is this something we should be concerned about? Not just for the frogs, but for us humans. Is it possible that if mushrooms can affect these frogs, can mushrooms start to sprout out of humans? This line of questioning seems to have become more present because of the recent hit show on HBO called The Last of Us, which tells the tale of an apocalyptic future where a strain of cordyceps takes over humans and turns them into flesh-eating zombies. Well, luckily this isn't something that we have to worry about. Sure, there was that case of psilocybin mushrooms apparently growing in someone's bloodstream, and 
And there are a handful of random cases throughout history of mushrooms apparently growing inside of people. Well, growing inside is kind of a strong word, more so the spores were able to form mycelium inside, which is still kind of scary. The most well-known one being Schizophyllum commune, which is a common mushroom whose spores can apparently infect humans. But in general, mushrooms aren't growing on humans. It's just not something to be concerned about. And realistically, they probably aren't truly growing on frogs either. As in, it's not actually that likely that the mushroom spores actually entered into the airway of the frog, took over its body, and then sprouted through the side of it. If that was the case, the frog likely would have been dead. More likely, as some of the articles had mentioned, was hypothesized by mycologists who took a look at this, and I would have to agree, is that the frog picked up the mushroom following an infection or wound, leaving a pitted area that the mushroom could cling to. Maybe there was even a little piece of wood or something in there that the mushroom found a way to get a hold of. It really doesn't take much, especially with a relatively small mushroom like seen here. Now, that theory would obviously fall apart if we started to see more and more mushrooms sprouting from frogs all over the place, but based on the rarity of this case, I think that is pretty unlikely. This seems like a one-off case and a super lucky find. But like I said at the top of the segment, mushrooms are tenacious. They really do just want to grow. For example, every once in a while, I will come across a Reddit post like this one, which clearly shows what appears to be oyster mushrooms growing right through the floorboards of what looks to be a pretty nice house. This honestly has such a nice aesthetic. If it weren't for the fact that the oyster mushrooms decay in a few days, I would almost be inclined just to leave them there. Here's a similar one, which apparently was in an RV, and it looks like it already dropped a bunch of spores. One commenter thought it was a Lusopexilis gigantis, but yeah, probably would be questioning the quality of the RV structure at this point. Here's another one. This is a personal favorite of mine, mushrooms growing out of what looks to be a toilet seal. These are oysters, I think. Honestly, it kind of looks like king oysters, but I don't think they actually are king oysters. Someone in the comments called them Take, which I thought was kind of funny. But believe it or not, there is a whole subreddit dedicated to mushrooms growing in weird places. It's called Our Bathroom Shrooms. And although many of them are growing in the bathroom, I guess because it is often humid in there and really good for mushrooms, it has all sorts of really neat pictures of mushrooms just doing their thing. So feel free to go check that out if that's something you're into. I definitely had a lot of fun browsing it. And after you look at a lot of those pictures, you might just think that maybe mushrooms growing on a frog isn't that crazy after all. On to our next story, which is some huge news in the mushroom retail front. Freshcap is launching an exclusive partnership with GNC stores across the US starting this month. Over 1,500 GNC stores across the US are gonna be carrying Freshcap's Ultimate Mushroom Complex capsules and powder, Lion's Mane capsules, and Cordyceps capsules. As maybe you know, functional mushrooms are getting more and more popular, and that means more and more people are going into retail stores like GNC and specifically asking asking for high quality mushrooms. GNC, being a retail chain on the leading edge of functional nutrition, noticed this and went to seek out a brand that they could forge an exclusive partnership with. And the one brand that was able to match their demands for both quality and for alignment was Freshcap, which is super exciting. So why these specific products? Well, to start, Lion's Mane, which I've mentioned many times before, has gone from relative obscurity to one of the world's most popular functional mushrooms. People are simply walking into stores and asking for it. Again, prompting GNC to seek out a brand that they could feel awesome about offering to their customers. And Cordyceps, being the mushroom for athletes, is also a perfect fit, as GNC appeals to both athletes and weekend warriors as a place to get everything from protein powder to pre-workout and now Cordyceps mushrooms. Finally, the Ultimate Mushroom Complex for overall wellness is a perfect match to GNC's mission to motivate and support the desire to live well. This is all very exciting. Again, mushrooms are hitting the mainstream and it really means that people all over the US are gonna be able to walk into one of any 1500 GNC stores and pick up their favorite Fresh Cat products. And before looking at this partnership, I had no idea just how many of these stores there actually were. Like basically, if you live in any major city, there's a really good chance that there is a GNC near you. So if you're a fan of the brand, if you are a fan of high quality functional mushroom products, make sure you head into your local GNC the next time you pass by and check it out. On to our next segment, trying to answer a very commonly asked question, which sounds simple, but actually it might be a lot more complex than you think. The question being, are mushrooms and fungi the same thing? 
Because whether or not you say fungi, fungi, or fungi, it describes something fundamentally different than a mushroom. The truth is that all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi are mushrooms. I thought it would be fun to take a look at the kingdom fungi as a whole and try to work out some of the differences so you can better understand this amazing slice of life on planet Earth. So what is fungi? By the way, I do say fungi. I know I get a lot of heat for it. If you say it differently, let me know in the comments, but it's just the way I've always said it. So fungi with a capital F is a kingdom. And there are only five of these kingdoms, which are basically the highest order taxonomical grouping of all living things on this planet. Those five kingdoms are Monera, which is basically bacteria, but also other organisms characterized by the absence of a nucleus and other membrane bound organelles. There's also protista, which are things like amoeba and algae and protozoans. And then of course we have plantae, which is of course all of those plants with cellulose based cell walls that are capable of photosynthesis. And of course we have animalia, which is, as the name suggests, animals, including us humans. And finally, there is the fifth kingdom, fungi which is actually characterized by two things. Number one is the fact that their cell walls are made of chitin, which is a hard structural polysaccharide. And number two is the fact that they absorb their nutrients from their surroundings by secreting enzymes and digesting things outside of their bodies instead of inside their bodies. And that is how I would describe a mushroom for sure. The cell walls are made of chitin, which is why mushrooms typically need to be cooked or extracted in order to get the most nutrients out of them. Their beneficial compounds are kind of locked up inside the cell walls of the mushroom, but you can also imagine that they have these vast mycelial networks that kind of crawl out across the forest floors, seeking enzymes and digesting nutrients. Interestingly, for much of history, there was only considered to be two kingdoms. That would be, of course, the plants and the animals. Fungi as a whole was just kind of lumped into the plants category. Category. And it wasn't until 1969 that fungi was actually given its own group, its own kingdom. But the vast majority of these fungi don't actually produce mushrooms. And when I say the vast majority, that represents a ton of different species. The State of the World's Fungi Report for 2023 from the Kew Royal Botanic Gardens estimates that there are over 2.5 million species of fungi worldwide, even though about 90% of them have yet to be discovered. So what are all of these non-mushroom forming fungi? Well, first we have molds, which whether or not they show up on your bread, underneath the floorboards, or in your mushroom growing project, these are often un wanted and kind of off-putting. Interestingly, molds are everywhere in nature, but they are only really visible to the naked eye when they get big enough to form large colonies. When that happens, it is associated with things going bad or rotting, and essentially that is what's happening. The mold is breaking down the organic matter, and in the meantime producing secondary metabolites and spores, which end up looking kind of nasty. But not all molds are bad, obviously. Here are some examples. Molds are important in food production. For example, to make soy sauce requires a group of molds called aspergillus species to break down soybean and wheat. The same mold is used to break down starch and rice in order to make sake. Molds are also super important in the production of certain pharmaceuticals, the most famous case being the mold penicillium, which led to the development of the antibiotic penicillin. Other important pharmaceuticals such as statin cholesterol lowering drugs are also derived from molds. Next up is yeasts, which makes up a very small portion of the fungal kingdom somewhere around 1%, but they are still very important. Most people are familiar with certain yeasts, and you might even have a jar of it in your fridge for the next time you make cinnamon buns. Yeasts are considered single cell fungi. The most commonly known one, of course, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which uses its fungal powers to help bread rise in the oven, but it also ferments sugars into alcohol to help make beer, wine, and other spirits. Beyond culinary uses and brewing uses, yeasts contribute to biofuel production by fermenting biomass into ethanol, which is a renewable energy source. And believe it or not, yeasts also play a role in scientific research, serving as a model organism in genetics and cellular biology. Their simple structure and quick generation time allow scientists to study genetic diseases and cellular processes, offering insights that are applicable to more complex organisms, including humans. Yet another segment of the fungal kingdom are rusts and smuts. Although they 
they're often less celebrated than their peers, and most of the time people are trying to prevent the growth of these rather than encourage it. Rusts have complex life cycles that involve multiple plant species. You can kind of think of them as globe-trotting pathogens that cause a spectrum of disease in crops, from grape vineyards to apple orchards, and they're responsible for rust-colored blemishes that can decimate yields, with some having historical impact. For example, a coffee rust epidemic in the late 19th century devastated coffee plantations in Sri Lanka and Java, dramatically shifting the global center of coffee production to South America. Smuts are similar, but have simpler life cycles and usually infect just a single host species. They produce masses of spores inside the tissues of the host plant, often causing the tissues of the plant to swell and form galls or tumors. The smut fungi consume the nutrients that would otherwise be used by the plant, leading to stunted growth. But smuts aren't all bad. One of them, known as corn smut, affects corn crops, but it is highly regarded as a delicious food, more commonly known as huilacoche. It does look a little bit gross to me, to be honest, but lots of people love it. Then of course are the lichens, which are estimated to include about 20,000 different species, but that number could easily be off by an order of magnitude just because of how little we know about lichens. This one is kind of fungi, but more so a complex symbiotic relationship between specific fungi fungi and photosynthetic algae or cyanobacteria. They may not seem that impressive, but based on the fact that they grow on rocks, they don't need much to be impressed themselves. They do play a significant role in breaking down rocks and are one of the few living things that can survive in harsh conditions from arctic tundras to desert sands. In fact, lichens have even grown in space on the space station. Not in the space station, but literally on the outside of the space station for 18 months. That is some pretty hardy stuff. Another cool thing about lichens, they're considered to be some of the oldest living things on the planet, with some individual organisms estimated to be thousands of years old. So as you can see, because of the vast number of species, fungi as a whole has a pretty massive impact on both our planet and on the economy in both positive and negative ways. One report that I read estimated that the economic impact of fungi worldwide is about $54 trillion. That is trillion with a T, which is absurdly large. We did do an episode to dive deeper into this report if you wanna go check that out. But if that stuff is all fungi, then what are mushrooms? How would you actually define what a mushroom is? Well, in its simplest form, mushrooms are just fungi that produce fruiting bodies. Those things that stick out of the ground or out of the tree or out of the little piece of dung. Those things are mushrooms. Which, after everything that we just talked about, kind of seems like mushrooms are a relatively small part of the fungal universe. Which might be true, but mushrooms definitely seem to punch above their weight. And we could still break it down more. Because there are mycorrhizal mushrooms, there are saprotrophic mushrooms, there are entomopathogenic mushrooms, there are wood-loving mushrooms and dung-loving mushrooms, tiny mushrooms and massive mushrooms, edible mushrooms and poisonous mushrooms, and mushrooms that are sometimes poisonous and sometimes edible. But that would be a topic for another episode, perhaps many other episodes. The bottom line is again, yes, all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi are mushrooms. And to me, that just makes mushrooms a little bit more special. And that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really does help the channel grow. And if you wanna see future episodes of the show, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. We'll see you in the next episode.